Welcome to the Leaders in Payments podcast, where we talk to C-level leaders from across the payments landscape. We'll be discussing the products and services that impact the payment space today, as well as trends and predictions for the future of payments. We will also hear stories from our guests about their journeys to the top. Creating, what I mean by create is never settle for the status quo right? We can always be thinking about what is a better solution? What is a a more effective way to do things? I don't think innovation is an event. It's a state of mind. So let's always be creating. That was Talbot Roche, the CEO and president of Black Hawk Network. And I'm truly honored to have her on the show as our special guest on this, the 103rd episode of the Leaders in Payments podcast, especially as we're celebrating Women Leaders in Payments Month, sponsored by American Express. Talbot grew up in Richmond, Virginia, and attended an all-girls school from kindergarten through high school. She majored in economics at Stanford and was the first student to go to any college west of the Mississippi from her high school. She co-founded Blackhawk Network, which was at the time a subsidiary within Safeway. During a holiday season 20 years ago, they put seven gift cards in the Northern California division of Safeway stores and did about $9 million in sales. Fast forward to now, and Blackhawk Network will do $26 billion this year in total load value across 28 countries. What a remarkable success story. Her guiding principles are simple. Commit, create, and connect. Talbot has some very impactful phrases that she used during our interview, such as focus on action over perfection, turn a crisis into an opportunity, and know your own worth and ask for the opportunity. We've got an amazing episode ahead, so let's get started. Hi, Talbot, and welcome to episode 103 of the Leaders in Payments podcast, and more specifically, the fourth episode in our special series of Women Leaders in Payments, sponsored by American Express. So thank you so much for being here. I appreciate you being on the show today. Thanks, Greg. I'm thrilled to be here. So first, maybe give us a little bit of information about yourself, maybe where you grew up, where you went to school, maybe a little about what your life was like growing up. Sure, I'd love to. Look, I've spent my entire adult life as a resident of California, but I was actually born and raised on the other side of the country in Richmond, Virginia. And I grew up there and I was fortunate to attend an all-girls school that started in kindergarten and took you all the way through 12th grade, to which both my mother and grandmother attended. And I would say I was fortunate because at an all-girls school, women are doing everything. They're the best academicians, the best athletes, they're the student body leaders, the best artists, you name it. And I also grew up with my mother and sister in Richmond. And through my whole childhood, watched my mother become a president of her realty company. So I always had a mother working outside the home in the early days because she needed to, in the later days because she really enjoyed it. So I think from an early age, my family and my school really modeled a world where women could do and did do everything. I didn't really understand barriers, so I think it just helped me at a very early age, learn to act with no consciousness of them and just assume that women could go out and do whatever they wanted to do. That's great. So when you were young and growing up, did you know what you wanted to be when you grew up? You know, I didn't have a real exact view. I did admire my father who practiced medicine. He lived out here in California. So I had a a mild interest, I would say, in exploring medicine, but I also lived with my mother who worked, as I said, in realty and just really enjoyed her customers. So I think I was inspired to explore both of those paths when I got to Stanford, where I attended college. Organic chemistry quickly convinced me not to pursue the medical route. (laughs) (laughs) And I have never looked back since. Okay. Was there anything in your upbringing that maybe pushed you towards payments or finance in any way? It's a great question. I don't know that I had anything that specifically pushed me into payments, but I would say that I had an early interest that was really born through the relationship with my grandfather in the investment world. I remember spending Sunday mornings with him looking at all the stock listings in the newspaper, if you can, I'm really dating myself here, but he would gift to me every 
holiday, a little bit of stock. And so I like to watch and quickly started to understand the value of the equities market and how you could invest and, and the power of compounding. So I think that gave me an early interest in how money can work, can build value over time, and the value of investing. And, and it was a great way for me to develop a shared interest with my grandfather. So I think early on, it kind of allowed me to start to connect with adults around investments and around business. I think you're very much like the rest of us who kind of fell into payments and then never figured out how to get out. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, you, it becomes an addiction. You love it. Right. Absolutely. So after high school, you mentioned you went to Stanford and I believe majored in economics. So what was your college experience like? Well, it was amazing. I mean, I think one of maybe the more interesting thing about my college experience is how I got there. You know, I mentioned I grew up in Richmond, Virginia, but I would visit my father for a month out of every summer and he was doing some medical research down at Stanford Medical Center and said, hey, Talbot, why don't you hop in the car and take a look at this school? Uh, you might be interested. This was the, I think, the summer of my junior year. And so he went off to the medical center. I then just started exploring the campus. And I found the admissions office and I went in and, and found whoever was working in the admissions office that day. And I explained to them, I was from Richmond, Virginia. I went to this all-girls school and I didn't understand why they didn't come and visit us like the other schools on the East Coast that came through for recruiting purposes and gave information sessions. Well, that following spring, he showed up. And that really piqued my interest. And, and uh, I decided to make the application to the school and ended up going. I was the first student from St. Catharines to attend Stanford. What first student actually to go west of the Mississippi from this all-girls school. And I'm really proud that many girls have followed in my footstep and attended Stanford. But I would tell you Stanford was an amazing eye-opening experience for me. First time I'd been in the classroom where there were was... Uh, men and women. And it was, but more importantly, I think being in California and having a focus on startups and entrepreneurialism, it really ignited in me an interest in business and really ignited in me an interest in innovation, which has been a cornerstone of my entire career. So I had a fabulous experience at Stanford. Okay. So after college, what was your very first job? Well, after, you know, in college, when we first started looking at jobs, I got very interested in management consulting. And I think in part because at that stage of my life, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do, but management consulting gave you an opportunity to kind of step into multiple types of business. So I went in to work for, as an analyst at, uh, at the time, it was called Touche Ross, but it later merged with Deloitte. And it was a management consulting practice. And I was fortunate enough to have one study that I worked on with the Clorox company. And I later jumped ship to Clorox to get into brand management because I really loved consumer facing businesses. And I think that was a great foundation. It's deep analytics. It's a marketing role, but it's it's deeply analytic in how you approach the business and how you think about it, how you run a PL. And I just loved this scale of the consumer business, right? So through the power of distribution, you can reach so many consumers and really scale the business. And, and I think that was the backbone to me starting to get into payments and how I founded Blackhawk. Okay, okay. Well, if you don't mind, we're going to pivot away from your career a little bit. And I'm going to ask you what I call some rapid fire questions. And I'd like for you to, where possible, give me one word answers. So it's going to be a little fun, a little bit uh, opportunity for us to learn a little bit more about you personally. So if you're okay with that, we'll, we'll jump in. Okay, absolutely. Okay. What was your least favorite subject in high school? Uh, I have to admit it was AP Chemistry. <laughs> okay. What is your favorite board game? Uh, it's a game that we play as a family called Bananagrams. It's like uh, Scrabble. Okay. If you could have any superpower, what would it be? See into the future. I think we all want to know what comes next. Okay, I agreed. What is your favorite season of the year? Summer. I love the longer days and the warmer nights. Okay. What is the most used app on your phone? Contacts. I really value my network, personal and professional, and I'm constantly tapping into it. Okay. If you could time travel, what period would you go to? 
You know, I would jump forward about two decades because I'd love to see how payments has evolved, how women's leadership has evolved, have we made any progress on how we're handling our planet, and who else besides Richard Branson has gone into space. <laughs> Interesting topic, right? Yeah. What is what is your favorite bird? Okay, as the CEO of Blackhawk, I have to say a hawk. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Would you rather be able to speak every language in the world or be able to communicate with animals? I love animals, but I'd rather speak every language because I also just uh, am completely passionate about travel and being able to communicate with lots of different people, I think would make that enrich that even more. Okay. If there was a movie about your life, who would play you? Oh, boy. <laughs> Maybe I'd have to say Reese Witherspoon just because she was also a Stanford graduate. There you go. Vanilla or chocolate? Vanilla. I love it. It goes with everything. Okay. All right. Well, that was the 10 questions. Thank you for entertaining us there. That was a lot of fun. So let's go back to your career and, and then dive some more into to women leadership. Obviously, you're one of the founders of Blackhawk Network, and that was born out of Safeway. And I believe at some point you had a part-time job at Safeway Marketing Services, which kind of where Blackhawk was born out of. So maybe can you walk us through kind of that journey at Safeway and how it was spun out and kind of just give us that background about the company? Absolutely. At the time, it was really exciting. But looking back on it, it's remarkable. When I joined in the early 2000s and co-founded Blackhawk Network, uh, we were a subsidiary inside of Safeway. And our mission was really to find businesses that would drive more traffic to the store. And one of the research foundings was that working women have about 30 minutes of discretionary time, but they control 70% of gifting dollars in any household. So how could we make gifting more convenient and give her another reason to shop inside the chain. At the time, gift cards were becoming popular. And so the very simple concept I mentioned I'd come from Clorox was to treat payments like a consumer packaged good and, and put it on the shelf alongside everything else in the store. You're already in the grocery store with two to two and a half times a week. Make it incredibly convenient to buy that gift card and offer a broad selection. So the first holiday, I'll remember in 2001, we ran it in a division, Northern California division of stores within the Safeway chain. And we offered seven cards and we did about $9 million in sales. We'll do $26 billion this year in total load value across 28 countries. So apparently what happened was by trying to make a payments more convenient and easier to access by putting them in a convenient location, we create an extraordinary business. Wow, that's fascinating. So early gift card days, who were the main gift cards? Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> there were some brands that you'll recognize and some that have, have sadly gone away. It was uh, Starbucks, Best Buy. Those are great brands that we still all use today. But it was also KB Toys and Blockbuster. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> cautionary tale, right? That right. some brands will make it and some don't. Right. So what are some trends or, or projects that you guys are currently working on? I know there's so much going on in the space. It continues to grow. I know gift cards have become everywhere all the time in, in retail stores everywhere. And I know you're getting more involved in gaming and digital and QR codes and using gift cards as incentives for companies. I mean, there's so much going on. Can you just kind of outline sort of maybe some major trends in the space? Absolutely. Look, through the years, gift cards have and do continue to be America's number one requested gift. And we, we love them as gift cards, but we are now more broadly servicing the market with what I'd call prepaid and value-added products. And that includes rewards, incentives, because as gift cards have become more accepted, corporations really understand they're a very effective incentive and reward. They've also digitized, and, and you mentioned gaming. Very important way to fund gaming and gaming, particularly through COVID, we all saw in-home entertainment take off and gaming specifically, which is a $180 billion global category. So gift cards are a great way to get value into the digital highway, but they are also a great way to support digital payments. And we're increasingly seeing with 
more use of our phones, more digital wallets, more e-commerce, the use of digital payments. So we've been very focused on e-gift and uh, QR code based payments that make it even more convenient, particularly for a millennial shopper to use gift cards, to pay with gift cards, to gift, to be incented and rewarded with it, all happening on the context of a mobile device. So it's a very exciting time in our industry as it is more broadly across payments right now. And we're also able to contextualize payments in non-commerce environments. And that makes it even more convenient and does what we really get excited about, which is connecting consumers with brands through payments even more seamlessly. Yeah, it's a fascinating space. And the amount of money being invested in payments and fintech is just uh, blows me away when I read the news almost every single day. Exactly. And I think that's because payments are really doing more now than just moving funds. They really are acting as a platform for consumer engagement and connection. Yeah, absolutely. So you talked a little bit about founding the company and then today you're the CEO and president. I think you were named CEO about five or six years ago. So maybe fill us in between when you started the company and maybe some of the roles you had, some of the functions, some of the the learnings as a leader that you've had and grown over the course of the last 20 or so years. Absolutely. When I joined Blackhawk or really co-founded it in the early days, I worked as a VP in business development. And I absolutely loved building those customer relationships. I then was promoted into an SVP role where I took on product and and really understood product marketing. And again, the sales side of it or business development side. I then stepped into a president role and and took on the total P&L for the domestic piece of the business, which at that point was the vast majority of our business. And that was over 10 years ago. And during that time, we actually then also took the company public, spun it out of Safeway, and it became a standalone company um, traded on the public market. I became CEO and sat in the chair as a public company CEO of Blackhawk for three plus years. And then we also, during right around that period, started to grow not just organically through our own innovation and expansion into new markets outside the U.S., but we grew inorganically through the acquisition of over 25 different companies that helped us diversify into the incentives market. So I had a lot of learnings about how to grow both organically and how to grow inorganically. And then we took the, I took the company private. And the reason for that was for us to streamline all of the systems and operations associated with the acquired assets so that we could become a more efficient operating model and scale our business globally into more markets, which we now operate in 28 markets. So what's been exciting about that journey has been there's been new lessons, new experiences and learnings and skills that I've needed to acquire in each of those roles. And that's really what I has kept me so excited and passionate about the organization is we never stop growing. We always are focused on what's next. How do we advance the solutions that we have in the market to better meet the needs of our consumers? And how do we grow our enterprise? And so I'm very proud of of what the company has accomplished. And I've been so excited to be a part of it along the way. Hey, this is your host, Greg Myers. And I'd like to take a quick minute to thank American Express for being the sponsor of the Women Leaders in Payments Month. American Express is a globally integrated payments company that provides customers with access to products, insights, and experiences that enrich lives and build business success. Again, thank you, American Express. And now back to the show. It's obvious you've been very successful in your career. So what would you say are some of your guiding principles? Yeah, that's a great question. I really think it's pretty simple. I I would sum it up by saying commit, create, and connect. What do I mean by that? Commit. There's only about one flavor I understand in terms of committing. It's 150%. I believe that when you're in something, you're in it 150%, which means you're going to give everything you have to it and you're really passionate about what you do. Creating, what I mean by create is never settle for the status quo right? We can always be thinking about what is a better solution? What is a a more effective way to do things? I don't think innovation is an event. It's a state of mind. So let's always be creating. And then finally, connect. And what I mean by that is 
success is not a singular path. It takes the support of many of those. It takes teamwork. Really connect with the people around you. That means customers. That means your employees. That can mean mentor relationships. Make sure that you're building trusting relationships around you. It also okay. just makes work more rewarding. Okay. And you mentioned the word mentor. So, so I'm going to ask a, a couple of questions around that. Who inspired you along the way? That, that's sort of the first part of the question. And why did they inspire you? And then the second part is, do you have mentors today? And did you have mentors and do you have them today? So sort of two parts, one about inspiration and one about mentorship. Yeah. Look, I think this is really important. I was personally inspired by my father, who went on in his career to achieve a lot in his field, which is medicine. He went on to become the president of the American Academy of Ophthalmology. But even in addition to that, he founded a couple of companies in the field that were dedicated to advancing glaucoma research. And so he had a broad influence. Again, it kind of speaks to that 150%. So you're committing to your field in a, in a big way. And I think that I always found that inspiring. He also developed a very broad network of people who had tremendous affection and respect for him. And, and I think so he he not only achieved a lot, but he and he's still with us. So, <laughs> and he did a lot of good along the way. But I would say, in terms of mentors, I have had quite a few. The one I'm the closest to is our prior CEO and chairman, Bill Tauscher. He was a former leader at Blackhawk, but had many other successes as CEOs uh, starting early in his career of different companies. And I just enjoyed a very trusting, open relationship with him, great exchange of ideas, partnership, somebody whose judgment I still count on today. And I, I'm happy to call both a professional mentor and a friend. Okay. Do you see mentorship as a as a sort of a, a more in casual may not be the right word, but thinking of women leaders coming up through the ranks and having mentors, do you see it more as like it should be a very thoughtful process that, hey, I, I need sort of my own personal board of advisors and I need a mentor to help me with this and a mentor to help me with that? Or or do you see it more of like a friendship kind of thing that you meet someone along the way and you call them a mentor? Kind of what's your view on that? It's a good question, Greg. And what I would do is not force anybody to choose one or the other, but pick what works for you. However, have a mentor. Right. So if you're more comfortable doing it through a formal framework, that's great. Go ahead and engage that way. There's many women's networks that actually I participate in, Blackhawk participates in, where formal mentorship is available. And that may be more comfortable depending on how you approach it. I have always organically developed great relationships with people on my board, with people in the field and in the industry and or people I've worked with. That's been comfortable for me. I think it's less important how you do it. It's more important that you do do it. Because look, all of us succeed by leveraging the experience and the judgment and the insights that those who've come before us can share. It's an incredibly valuable asset. So I don't know why people wouldn't tap into it. I also personally find it very rewarding to have great relationships in my work environment and to have these trusting relationships where you really can bounce ideas off. It just makes you better. This idea that you have all the answers coming in, nobody does, right? So why not leverage the benefit of those who have other experiences or more experiences? And I don't think it matters how you do that. Right. It reminds me of the saying, and I might butcher it, but you can go, you can go fast alone or you can go further together, something like that. Yeah, yeah. I think that's true. I think great things are generally accomplished through great teamwork. And the people who aren't afraid to, to ask for insights or to just naturally develop those relationships tend to also uncover new opportunities for themselves as well through those relationships. So I, I think it's more than just the insights. It's, it's also just access to more experiences. Sure. So what is one characteristic that you believe every woman leader should possess? Oh, okay. So confidence. Confidence. And what I would say is if you don't have it, learn it. And some, I think 
this is harder for women because they tend to be harder on themselves, right? So if they look at a new opportunity, there's been studies done on this, where let's say they have eight of the 10 characteristics or skill sets required for the job. They'll focus on the two rather than focusing on the eight and say, I'm not qualified. Whereas on average, a man's more inclined to say, I have eight, I'm qualified. Have the confidence that you are smart and through hard work, will figure things out as you go. You don't have to have everything figured out in advance of leaning in. Another way of saying that is focus on action over perfection, right? There's no need for everything to be ticked and tied to get started. It's more impactful to act than to wait until you have everything figured out. Right. I think that's great insights there. What do you personally do to ensure that you're continuing to grow and and developing as a leader? Well, I think I shared with you that I keep pushing Blackhawk to do more. There's new chapters of growth that we've gone through. I have to put myself in an uncomfortable position to grow, right? You always want to be doing things that make you a little uncomfortable. So if that's learning how to do acquisitions, learning how to do a transformation after having done those acquisitions, recruiting new talent to the team... Always push yourself to surround yourself with talent that is stronger than yourself, right? Because you want to be, you want to be around people who can teach you. So I think it's just pushing yourself outside your comfort zone and in whatever form or factor that takes. Okay. How do you think we're doing as an industry as far as having female leaders in in major, doesn't have to be major roles, but just in leadership positions in our industry. How do you, how do you think we're doing and thinking back, you've been in the industry for a while and have we improved and, and what should we be doing to get better? I'm a little uncomfortable that I get attention as being a CEO of a fintech or technology company because I'm a woman. It's still too rare. We need to be doing better than we're doing today. I see so much talent around our industry, female talent. And I think it's going to come from all of us continuing to pull up other women around us, make sure that we are focused on diversity, not just gender diversity, in how we promote talent within our own organizations and governance more women on boards is critical because it sets the stage. It says to the organization, we value women's leadership at the highest levels. And I think it's going to take putting more women on boards, which we're actively doing. I see the industry doing that. All industries are doing that. But until that uh, becomes more common practice, I think we're still going to have deficits. So I wouldn't say that the payments industry is a standout in, do- in, in doing this. I wouldn't say any technology industry is, right? We've had a lot of attention because our senior leadership team, when you look at gender and ethnic diversity, we 60% is diverse. So that's unusual in the payments industry. And I wish it wasn't so exceptional. Yeah. I think there are a lot of female leaders in sort of the I would say, you know, VP level and and a lot of up and coming stars in the industry. If you could kind of just step back and give some broad advice to them to say, what would your advice be to help them get to the next level to be successful? It's a question that we talked a lot about. I did a series on diversity and inclusion, and we talked a lot about sort of that level of employees sometimes are overlooked. So I'm curious, like, what would you tell that sort of tier of employees, you know, specifically the women leaders in that kind of tier, what advice would you give them to help them be more successful? It's a really good question. When I look back through the years, the biggest breakthroughs have come from one of of two things. One is resilience. And what I mean by that is when you face some kind of challenge, in your career or in your business or maybe in your personal life and career balance, look at that challenge, try to reframe any crisis as an opportunity, right? If you become overwhelmed by the challenge, you're not going to be as effective. If you look at it as an opportunity to do something different, to find a solution, to create new value, to overcome that challenge, you will set yourself apart. So, A crisis isn't always a bad thing. It's an opportunity to shine. The second is know your own worth and ask for the opportunity. 
be proactive about it. Sometimes that's uncomfortable to push yourself forward and, but let people know you want more opportunity and it will come to you faster. If people know you're a willing participant, you're raising your hand, you're saying, I want to jump in here and to the ability that you can act at the next level, go ahead and just take on responsibility and keep your eye on creating value for your enterprise. As long as you're taking care of the customer, you're driving value and you're doing good, and good things will happen to you. So I think it's those things, resiliency and know your own uh, value, and go ahead and be be very open about the fact you want more opportunity. Do you think that men naturally do that more than women? <laughs> I do. I do. I do, and I think women may need to, to quiet the voice in their head that tells them, hey, maybe that's not what I should be doing, or that's uncomfortable. That doesn't matter right? What you really are trying to do is create more value for your organization. If you keep it at that level, it isn't about your own personal advancement as much as it is about creating value for the enterprise. I think that gives people, that gives women a different way to frame that conversation and perhaps feel more comfortable about it. Okay. What is one thing that you know now about work in your career that you wish you had known earlier? Don't spend as much time worrying right? You can worry about things. Challenges are going to come and they're going to go. Trust the undeniable power of hard work. Hard work has its own gravity to create value and to propel you forward. I think effort is the biggest component of success and it knows no gender, race, or bias. Okay. Well, this next question I'm sort of stealing from another host of a show. Guy Raz hosts a podcast called How I Built This. And he always asks, and I I think it's a great sort of summary question, how much of your success do you attribute to hard work versus luck? Well, I think maybe my prior answer is a bit of my answer. (laughs) I believe that if you apply yourself totally, that the power of hard work is really important. And it's not just, as I said before, it's not just grinding it out. It's bringing both your mind and your heart to what you do. And I I call that giving 150% if you're fully engaged in solving the problem. It doesn't mean that luck doesn't play a role. But over time, the biggest component is effort. And I mean that because careers are created over decades. They're not a spurt of energy here or there. There might be luck in one instance, but over time, it's the effort that's the biggest arbiter of success. Okay, I agree completely. So we've covered a lot of ground today from your career, a lot of great advice you've given. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we wrap up? You know, Greg, I just want to thank you for taking the time to speak with all the women leaders that you're featuring this month. We all have different voices and experiences, but it's sharing those different perspectives that provides the power to inspire and support many other women across our industry. So I want to thank you. Oh, no, thank you. And and I really appreciate your time today. I know your time is very valuable. So again, thank you so much for being on the show. Absolutely. And to all you listeners out there, I thank you for your time as well. And until the next story. Thank you for joining us this week on the Leaders in Payments podcast. Make sure you visit our website at leadersinpayments.com, where you can subscribe to the show and where you'll find our show notes. If you enjoyed listening, please share on your social channels as well. 